everyone, welcome in to the Sports in the Mitten podcast powered by Mr. Spots. My name is Thomas Bendit. I'm the co-host, and our other co-host is Adam. Adam, how's it going? I'm doing well, Thomas. I'm doing well. It's an exciting day. I'm glad the weather's, weather's finally getting a little bit nice. So, uh, you know, excited about that. Spring game this Saturday. So we'll have a lot to talk about in that regard. And then a little bit of Michigan basketball notes as well. Yeah. It's I, I want to mention Miles Bridges as well because maybe he comes back, maybe he doesn't. We don't know. Yeah. But there is a lot to talk about. Yeah, it's been a dramatic day around Detroit sports and the college sports teams as well. You know, Joe Lewis closes last night. Palace is closing tonight, at least for NBA basketball. And uh, the Tigers are going too. I, I was being tortured in work today. On the, <laughs> I, I work in downtown Detroit for my day job. And uh, I was looking over in Comerica. You know, the lights were turning on and everybody was getting ready to go. And I'm like, oh, geez. Such a nice day. Uh, <laughs> stuck and you're stuck office. in the office. Just yeah. uh, <laughs> loving life. That's the, I guess that's like the perks of working. To, it's like the perks, but it's also like it's a tease because a lot of people who work downtown Detroit, you know, during the summer, you can hear the roar from Comerica and everything. But at the same time, you're at your desk. You have to do uh, grown up things, <laughs> professional things. <laughs> you were at the baseball game but i mean at least yeah. you're close at least you're close yeah it is it is nice for that but um yeah today was one of those days you know it's always the first sunny day that they have a home game on um it's always rough but uh <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless well, yeah. well hopefully thomas hopefully you make it through i mean they uh they did <laughs> win so you could take you could take comfort in that they did win yeah yeah two to one Good news there. Good news there. But uh, yeah, so let's let's dive into this uh, Michigan spring spring talk then. Not sure if people have uh, realized or not, but Rashawn Gary is going to have a mind. I'm. Uh, it's almost like. Do you remember last year predicting? You know, Jabril Peppers had the type of season I think everybody knew he was capable of having. He did all the things going to do right i mm-hmm. think this is going to be one of those type of years for rashawn gary where he becomes i think he's already one of the top uh linemen in the big 10 he's just played behind you know the top defensive line in the country he's developed he's gotten a lot smarter a lot harder i talked to uh, rashawn about that i talked to greg madison about that i'm expecting a monster year from rashawn he was the number one pick in their spring draft so i mean that says a lot in terms of what his teammates think of him. And I mean, they've been saying this, what, ever, you know, ever since last year, it's nothing new, but it's just now keep growing. Rashawn Gary is going to be a monster. Uh, I can't wait to see him Saturday because I think he's going to just show that. I mean, he's incredibly fast, strong. He's got, he's got NFL written all over him. I mean, he is, Mm -hmm. He's gonna he's gonna be fantastic fantastic lineman. He's gonna I think he's gonna have a big t- a big season all Big Ten. I mean I don't know maybe he's an All American who knows but um, Rashawn I'm excited to see Wilton Spate was the number two pick so I mean that says you know that says a lot I think and for those who have kind of doubted Wilton or maybe were unsure thought that there was competition it maybe may because you know on Twitter, on message boards, and um, conversations with friends. Oh, boy. <laughs> there, there's always, well, what, you know, it's a competition. Nothing's guaranteed. Look, it's guaranteed. Wilton Spate is the quarterback. He is the guy. He's the face of the program. So I don't think there's any debate in that. Wilton, Wilton Spate might even ex- exceed some of the expectations I had for him. And I thought uh, when he committed, I thought coming in, I was confident he's going to be a starting quarterback. But as far as, you know, program leader, face of the program, you know, that's kind of un- it's, uh, new territory. But I think Wilton's proved it, you know, throughout the way that he conducts himself with the media, uh, the way that he plays. He's got a confidence about him. He's, everything is going well for him. And I think if you're a Michigan fan, you want to hear that, right? You want to hear that 
your quarterback is really confident, and he is next level. Uh, Sam Sam Webb reported this last week. Confirms, you know what what I thought, and I think what maybe some other people thought too. Wilton Spate is heads and tails, shoulders, knees, elbows, <laughs> everything, chins, uh, ahead of the competition. There is not going to be a battle for a starter. I mean, there's going to be a battle for number two, but Wilton is the guy. So uh, with that said, I'm excited to see him play just because we, you know, he didn't have the best Orange Bowl. Mm-hmm. That Ohio State game, I thought he showed a lot of a lot of. Uh, I was going to say, well, I might as well say it. it's balls. I mean, we can say <laughs> balls. It's okay. Balls in that Ohio State game. Winning at Michigan State, I think he showed some too. He's a tough kid. Mm-hmm. You know, he played. He was injured. He wasn't 100% healthy last year. Uh, not all the time. He said he feels I, great. I don't, I don't. And then thirdly, Kareem Walker. Mm-hmm. We talk, we'll talk, I guess, more about freshmen. But I guess if I got to pick top three guys I want to see, it's Rashawn. Kareem and Kareem Walker, everybody said, you know, and the same thing from last year. The guy makes plays and practice. He's this, he's that, you know, all the superlatives. So I think those are three guys that you, and obviously there's different tiers and breaking it down, but I think just on the surface, those are three guys that I'm going to be immediately watching. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think to start off with this Wilton Spate criticism, I have no idea where it's coming from. It, it's laughable to me. And yeah. well, I, sh- I shouldn't say I have no idea where it's coming from because this is the obvious. I mean, I know we've talked about this before, this whole, like, everybody always thinks the next thing is going to be better than what they have now. Oh, you know, nothing can ever get worse. Nothing can ever stay the same. It's always, you know, the next recruit is, is an All-American. You know, whoever, is on, whoever was on your team, they're, the, they're actually terrible. You know, pe- fans will spend the whole summer talking up. You know, take, for instance, uh, I'm just totally arbitrarily choosing a name, but like Taco, for instance. All summer last year, Michigan fans would be, oh, Taco's going to be the best. He's going to be unstoppable. And then the minute he leaves to go to the NFL, you know, graduates, well, he wasn't that good. You know, I, the, the next guy's going to be the best. Oh, I know. Much better. Um, <laughs> I, I hear you, man. I'm, and why? Like, it, <laughs> I, I don't know what it is. I think it's just like the shiny new toy syndrome. You always think it's like cool and exciting. But, yeah, Wilton Spade's going to be the quarterback. He's going to be the quarterback easily. I don't think there's going to be a second of drama. Um, I, I feel like to an extent this is a little bit like that the first year with Rudock where there was a little drumming up of interest. You know, oh, we got a battle. But um, I remember I went to – I don't know if you remember this, but they had an open practice for the uh, the students at the time. And I still had an M card, so I snuck in and went. And uh, <laughs> um, it was like so. I won't tell anybody. It, it, it was so <laughs> obvious that Rudock was the number one quarterback that I, I left laughing at the idea that anyone was considering it a competition. And I feel like that's what this is like. Wilton Spate is head and shoulders, as he said, uh, 15 other body parts ahead of anyone else. He's going to be the quarterback. And, you know, I. I I think if you're a Michigan fan, you want him to be the quarterback. He was productive last year. He was consistent. Um, Obviously, he tailed off towards the end of the year, which, I mean, it's hard to rip him too much on that Ohio State game or the Florida State game. I mean, he was was limited. You know, he was injured. Um, And then, two, both of those teams have really good defenses. A lot of quarterbacks struggled against those teams this year. Um, And to me, the the most impressive thing he had last year – despite a loss was that Florida state game when he was just getting destroyed for the entire first half. I mean, that D line was just killing him and he finally just decided, okay, you know what? I'm just going to step up into these throws. I'm going to take the hits and I'm just going to complete the passes. And, you know, obviously they didn't come out on top, but I thought his second half was really impressive. And if he can play like that going forward, spells good news for, for Michigan, but things I'm looking forward to this weekend um, as I said, I, I kind of already feel like we know what to expect out of Spate. But, uh, um, yeah, Rashawn Gary, I mean, everyone's expecting he's going to be the best player on the team, at least on paper. So, I mean, you're obviously looking for him to have a dominant performance. And I'm, I'm really interested to see the depth on the defensive side of the ball. You know, they've lost so many guys to the pros this year. And where is the depth going to come from? Is it from some of these early enrollees? Is it from – 
you know, some of the freshmen who didn't play much last year, some of the older guys finally getting a chance. Uh, you know, Tyree Cannell pops to mind, you know, guys like that. What what are we going to see uh, from that side? And on, on the offensive side, I mean, maybe this is a shiny new toy syndrome, but uh, Donovan Peoples-Jones, I really, I really am curious to see what he can do. Uh, you know, highest rated guy in the class. So obviously a lot of expectations for him. Yeah, and Don, and Donovan, of course, for me too. And and I remember hearing uh, Wilton talk about, you know, and that's important because that was that was something that a lot of people mentioned. And I'm not by any means comparing them head to head. People like Calvin Johnson, right? A mm-hmm. lot of people marveled at his catch radius. Uh, Wilton was saying, you know, the the plays. I, I Donovan is the kind of guy who can make headline catch saying the radius he covers a lot of ground you know i mean he's not he's not the biggest receiver out there uh but he's very athletic i like him i mean he's not he's not tiny either i mean he's what he's 6'2 195 i mean he's not a runt by any means but i mean he's not he's not you know i mentioned calvin you know size wise he's not 6'5 and you know 200 or you know whatever calvin was what was calvin 240 something like that anyway yeah and when you met when you mentioned uh, the defensive side of the ball, guys, uh, David Long's been mentioned, you know, and, and I think I think we David Long got mentioned last year actually, and then he got injured. So I think David Long David Long has been there. Uh, Tyree, I think he's been there. I mean, he got in the mix a little bit too, but we might see Keith Washington. Uh, Keith Keith's been mentioned, and I've been wondering about it. Was it was kind of funny because I remember mentioning uh, to a friend I. I, I I don't know who it was. I was talking to somebody before the availability, and I mentioned I'm like, I got I want to ask about Keith Washington. Like, you know, where's Keith? I remember last time you heard about him, he in the parking lot outside of his house or something, and with Jim Harbaugh. <laughs> didn't he, didn't he run in like socks or something or barefoot or? I know it was impromptu. He just got off. He just you know said, hey, I'm gonna go run a forty for you, and he did it. And because I remember <laughs> Harbaugh telling the story. Uh, so yeah, you know, you're wondering about. Uh, you're wondering about. And also, don't forget uh, Lavert Hill. Mm-hmm. You know, Lavert, and that was a big flip. Remember, he was committed to Penn State, and uh, brother, uh, younger brother Delano. Yeah, Lavert's uh, been mentioned in there as well. So I think, yeah, you're losing Jordan Lewis, you're you losing Shannon Stribling and Demonte Thomas. Um, I, you know, I haven't heard anything about Jeremy Clark lately. Last I knew, you know, that's something. I'm t- Jim Harbaugh will be uh, available for. A, it's on Wednesday. So Clark, last I know, last I had heard they were applying, you know, six year and it sounded like that that was going to happen, but I think they had uh, said it know, wasn't going to happen, but that's what I had heard. Um, oh, it has happened. No, it, that he's not coming back. He's going to head out to the, the NFL and such. As far as I'm aware, well, where was I? So <laughs> where, where was I on this? I'm talking about, I'm like, okay, without Jerry, I feel like I'm late to the party on, on this one. So okay, oh, okay, without Jeremy Clark, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna lose uh, some experience. You're gonna lose uh, a little bit of leadership, I guess. But in terms of talent, I do think there might be a drop off though. I mean, I'm not. Mm-hmm. Last year, I thought ten win team, no doubt in my mind. This year, it's I think eight nine wins. It depends on a couple different factors. I mean, last year there was an improved running game, right? Because the offensive line had improved. What if, and this is in theory, that this offensive line doesn't experience any drop off? What if these guys are good? I mean, they're. I mean, I'm not saying that they wouldn't be good, but you know what I mean. What if? Mm-hmm. What if? You know, just think about that. What if the run game gets going? That gives another dimension to an offense that isn't scary. Maybe Chris Evans. You know, he gets a little bit of space. I mean, uh, Davion had a couple big plays, but as in general, uh, watching Michigan football, especially, you know, past five years, other, okay, with exception to Denard, and then we look at Fitz Toussaint, the last 1,000-yard rusher in 2011, I mean, you know, blow you away, picked up some yards. But bottom line is nothing about Michigan's run game has really said, okay, wow, these guys can be scary. So let's say, for instance, the offensive line uh, is at least serviceable, and then we see a guy like Kareem 
provide that big time threat on the run game. Chris is up seven pounds. He went from he said uh, two hundred five to two to two twelve, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a, when you're when you're conditioning and stuff that five seven pounds it can make a difference. He said he feels stronger. Fast. Who knows? That's what I'm saying. The the what if about the offensive line and the run game is what kind of interests me. And then we also have, you know, there's not Jake Butt, okay, at tight end. Ian Bunting, I think, is the is the logical guy there. Uh, maybe we see Nick Eubanks. You know, I mean, I was excited about Devin transferred. He was more of a blocking kind of guy, he, although his first catch was a touchdown. But the receivers, there's a lot of what if on this team as where last year it was what if, but it was based on a lot of what we already knew. You know, you understand what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I feel like you can pin it right now. I mean, obviously, there are two groups on this team, position groups, that are obviously red flags. The first is the secondary. Um, and, and you've talked – just because you're losing everyone. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we've, we've talked about it. You know, uh, you mentioned guys like David Long, Lavert Hill, uh, and, you know, Tyree Cannell, guys – Khalid Hudson, you know, there's there's plenty of guys there where I I don't know if it's just me, but I feel pretty confident the secondary is going to at least be okay, especially considering that you have that D-line and those linebackers in front of them. I, I think, generally speaking, it's easier to hide the secondary than the second position group, which is the O-line. And, you know, you mentioned the rushing ones, the rushing issues Michigan's had recently. I know we've talked about it before on the podcast, but – Michigan, if they're going to be a championship level team, they got to be able to rush the ball at some point, and not running up 300 yards against Rutgers or something. We're talking about key plays in big games. You want to talk about a couple games last year? If you could have ran the ball against Iowa, if you could have ran the ball against Ohio State, those would have been wins without a doubt. I mean, you were up both those games. All you had to do was run out the clock at the end, and Michigan's line couldn't do it. They couldn't finish the job. I mean, even to a certain extent, that Florida State game. Um, and, I mean, you go back the year before. I mean, do we even need to talk about that Michigan State game with that punt situation? I mean, we could if you want to. But. <laughs> like, all they had to do was pick up one first down, and the game's over. Um, and there's there's a lot of these games where the offensive line has cost them games. And until they can get over that hurdle – to where they have a key first down they got to pick up in the third or fourth qu- fourth quarter and they can lean on the line to get them you know five six yards when they need it uh this the program and the team is never going to be able to hit that next level uh it, it's it's unfair to put all of those issues on this group especially because a lot of them are so young and haven't played but I, to me that that's the concern for michigan because you know, Chris Evans, just look back to Michigan in 2013 when they had Gardner. Um, I, I want to say, wasn't Fitz still on the team at that point? Um, they had – okay, is that, is, was that his last year? Um, yeah. Okay, well, 2013, they had a few – they had a few running backs, but that line was just a destructive mess, and it killed what probably – if they had an even mediocre line that year, they probably would have won 10, 11 games, I would have, I would think. And they ended up at, what, like 7-6 and six or something um, in the Buffalo Wild Wings Bowl. And, uh, I, and again, it's unfair to put all of that on, on this group, but we've seen you have to have a good line if you want to be a championship-level team. And for Michigan, they need to figure out a way to at least come close to last year's level if they want to have a chance to, to contend with, you know, Penn state, Ohio state and teams like that. I, f- I feel like that the, the offensive line has trended in the right direction. And if you look at, and I, I remember back, I mean, okay, Derek green didn't turn out to be mm-hmm. what people thought, but recruiting wise, at least on paper with Derek, that people forgot that Devion was like a top uh, 20 or top 15 running back in that same class. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody was, was focused on Derek Green, but De- uh, Devion was, was a highly rated uh, back as well. And then I think, what, Drake Johnson? I mean, there was depth there. It's just, I guess we didn't see, A, development from 
those guys and development from the offensive line. And, and don't forget, too, NFL star Thomas Rawls was on that team. Well, uh, that's who, who I could count on, like, a couple of hands, I think, and maybe my toes, how many carries he had at Michigan. And, and again, I think people who listen to the podcast uh, know that I know Thomas. Very proud of Thomas for the Seattle Seahawks. Um, uh, unknown guy in Michigan, goes to Central, gets injured, goes undrafted, and then starts for the Seattle Seahawks. So, I mean, who knows? Who knows what? Uh, that, that's that's a what? That's a whole different conversation. That's yeah, a lot. That's yeah. a wild ride. But I'm personally, I'm I'm very uh, I'm very happy for Thomas. But uh, what were we talking about here? I started thinking offensive started, line uh, trending. I'll say, yeah, offensive line trending in the right direction. They do have guys who are good enough uh, who can maybe take advantage of a little bit. Maybe the offensive line isn't all the way there. You know what I mean? It used to be okay. Was maybe the running backs were middle of the road or above average recruiting wise were, but the offensive line was down here development wise. And as the offensive line, I feel like went, we didn't see the progress from those other running backs. So then the, eventually the offensive line kind of superseded. And then I think what we saw 2015 a little bit, but uh, certainly last year, I think we saw the running back group kind of catch up a little bit. But then we weigh here. The loss of three starters on the offensive line, three all Big Ten guys, and Eric Magnuson, uh, Kyle Kalis, and Ben Braden. And we don't know exactly what the line's going to look like. But, you know what I mean? I feel like there's got to be some kind of happy medium here as I'm playing with my hands and hopefully demonstrating uh, the ebbs and flows of the offensive line and running back group. So I do believe that there's enough talent there. I like Chris Evans. I really do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to see him. Yeah, I mean. What's the for it? Easy tackle, like, there's a very – there's a particular way to bring him down. I feel like he gets brought down at the hips a lot. I don't feel like he's got that strength to get out of a hip tackle. You yeah. know what I mean? Getting wrapped – because guys are, you know, wrapping you up at the hips. That's what they're taught to do. I don't feel like – I don't feel like Chris, at least not at the NCAA level, uh, is strong enough yet. And maybe – Putting on those seven pounds and, and further conditioning, maybe. But again, sight unseen. I'm, I'm ecstatic uh, to see Kareem Walker because I want to piece right that dominant. If, are we going to see Michigan have a dominant running back? That's the missing piece. There's a good quarterback there. There's potential with the wide receivers. You know, maybe everything can catch up. Maybe that's. I don't know. Spring yeah. game. I mean, Spring game, I, I guess, is going to show us what we need yeah. to see. As a, as I guess a final thought here, I uh, I kind of agree. I mean, I this is my kind of theory, and I I always say it, like wide receivers are really nice. Having great receivers is is always a plus. You know, no one's ever going to be like, oh man, I wish we had some terrible receivers out here. Right. Uh, <laughs> but I would much rather have a quarterback. I feel like if you have a really good quarterback, he's going to find open guys, especially at the college level. They're going to get enough of those little passes over the middle and whatnot. Um, but you, Michigan desperately needs a running game, a consistent running game. And, you know, whether that's one guy, whether that's, you know, a thunder-lightning type of situation, whatever you want to talk about, you know, two, three guys, whatever. Um, and I, I just – I will continue to say this all offseason, but it's going to be on that offensive line. If that offensive line can come anywhere close to last year – I think this team, and particularly the offense, is going to be really good. If not, uh, things things are going to get tricky, <laughs> especially I, against uh, you know Penn State and Ohio State with those D lines. My my final thought about the Michigan uh, spring game and my and I'll run game and do because you mentioned the wide receiver thing, mm-hmm. and then it's kind of and I'm not comparing head to head at all, but Michigan State. Okay. Michigan State, okay, yeah, they had the they had the defense, you know, 2013, 14, 15, really good defense. Okay, but let's look at what worked offensively. Didn't really have superstars at wide receivers, like you were saying. I mean, I, I feel like Michigan State's formula was Michigan State's always been able to run the ball. I mean, we can name off all kinds of running backs, and you mentioned the uh, Thunder and Lightning, you know, the Cedric Irvin, or not, or not Cedric Irvin, rather, but uh. 
His name is uh, s- slipping by me right now. Who in the heck was that in the backfield with J.U. Colkirk? Javon Ringer. How am I forgetting Javon oh, Ringer? Okay. So yeah. Javon and uh, J.U. Colkirk, Thunder and Lightning. I mean, we've seen, you know, in the years past, Michigan State kind of keeps a good stable of running backs. And I feel like Langford, he, he supplied some big play. That's kind of an element that Michigan's offense is missing. Whether they do it by committee, done, you know, with a featured back, where a constant, consistent threat. Everybody knew, I think, playing Michigan State, like, hey, you have to let Michigan State can run the ball. You got to watch out. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe they don't have the superstar, five star running back, but I mean, they got somebody that's back there that's going to get the job done. So, like I said, my final note on Michigan spring football, particularly the running game, that's you want to see more of that, more of that threat. If it'll be a good thing, though, if you see the running backs run all over the defense in the spring game, right? <laughs> you don't want – that's another thing. It's kind of hard to gauge. It's twos and threes mixed up and goes out there and dissects the is – that, is that a really good thing for him or a negative for the Michigan defense? So um, let's talk Michigan basketball. I know because a couple – a little bit of news today, I guess. Uh, DJ and Mo, guys, that they're going to test the waters. But in a way, I I, kind of, I am surprised that they both declared. I, I figured next year would be the year. But they must be getting some good intelligence and saying, hey, them and the mock drafts that I've looked at were predicted as, as first round picks, at least today. I'm sure you know, when we see some updated ones in the coming days, maybe they are. One of them. Uh, predicted a, as a first round pick and if you look at I feel like there's some pretty skilled big men and it would be to their benefit to stay to where they can be you know lottery pick potential top 15 top 20 uh, potential because there's a lot of good you know Jonathan Isaac Florida State comes to mind Lori Markman from Arizona I mean what if we saw Mo kind of I feel like I feel like everybody's going goo goo and gaga over. Okay, they played well toward the end of the season. Let them play well for a whole year and develop. I mean, there's age, right? Turn the page next year. Think of how good these guys can be. And I know the goal is get to the pros. And I don't know what DJ and Mo are thinking, but I think Michigan would be very it would be a very good team next year if they return. I think that they should return for development wise because, like I said these guys until the end of the year i think people follow michigan basketball realize that this potential was there nobody was really talking about these guys and now all of a sudden you're going to say okay um let's let's start uh, looking at their nba futures let's look at them become as good a college player as they can before we talk about going to the nba and and that's a whole another argument too in itself but what do you think about just hearing them there's no harm right yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say three things. First, you know, as a reminder to everyone, I want to say two years ago, maybe it's been three years now, uh, the NBA changed the rules to where you can declare for the draft, you can be evaluated, you can work out, but you don't hire an agent and you can return to college. So right. the cutoff is May 24th, which is well over a month. We're talking like a month and a half that these guys are likely going to be in this limbo stage where – they're declared, but they can still come back to school. And for for a lot of people, the big the big thing is the combine. If you are not invited to the combine, they're coming back. It almost yeah. always happens they're coming back. So that'll be the big indicator whether these guys get. Now, if they get invited, that doesn't mean they're going to stay in it. But just know if they don't get invited, they're going to come back. That's that's kind of how this works. Um, second thing is is uh, I am very very pro declaring early. I always say this, um, if you can get the money, go get it. Because if somebody offered me a million dollars to leave school early, I would be like, okay, where do I sign? Right. Uh, <laughs> please, please uh, take me. Yesterday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, like I, I'll go back to school later. Um, but <laughs> the reason I say that is because you have to consider it in that if you're an intelligent player, you know, who has a chance to make the pros, you have to think of it as I need to maximize how I can get this money. Right. and the reason I say that is because sometimes declaring early is not always the best way. And we talked about this when we were talking about the Pistons, whether they should tank or not, like a week or two weeks ago. 
But this is a really deep draft class. You can get down to the edge of that lottery, and every guy, you're like, wow, you know, that guy could be a potential star down the road. Yeah. And you can franchise, all get franchise guys. Oh, yeah. And you can get down to the end of the first round, and you can still be like, oh, yeah, I could see that guy turning into a starter down the road. This is a really, really deep year. Uh, for the draft. I mean, if, if you look, uh, Jawan Evans, who plays for Oklahoma State, you know, Michigan fans will remember him. They played him a couple weeks ago in the NCAA tournament. Uh, he was like a borderline lottery pick last year, and he's barely going to be in the first round this year. And that's not because he's gotten worse. That's because the field is much, much better. So the reason I went on this rant is to say that, you know, Michigan's guys, if they're going to be projected in the second round, they can just wait a year and probably move up 10, 15 spots just by the nature of the game. Um, I'm a little skeptical of these guys ending up as lottery picks, especially Wagner. I don't know if he has the, the raw physical attributes to do that. But, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, would, I would say, though. No. <laughs> um, can, so can you believe that there's somebody at my house? That is unlucky. Um, Someone is. Someone is seriously knocking on my door right now. They'll have to come back. Um, yeah, bad timing. Um, no, but I, I would just say that I think both of those guys can move up into the first round if they come back for another year. I, I anticipate that. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, go ahead and finish. I'll be right. The, the, the beauty of live streaming. I have to go attend yeah. to this. <laughs> um. I, uh, I will just say that I, I am anticipating both of these guys are going to come back next year um, and enter next year's NBA draft, or at least if they're you know still viewed as highly at that point. It'll be interesting to sort it all out, but um, I, I just I don't see how this hurts either one of them. You know, get evaluated, work out with some good players. And again, they get to go to these team workouts, which is great experience. And the guys are going to tell them. They're going to give them reports as to what exactly they need to work on um, and, and so so on and, and so forth. Um, but uh, it'll, it'll be an interesting, uh, it'll be an interesting little, little uh, evaluation here. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, interested to see how it all plays out. And uh, I'm I'm expecting a uh, some good news as as far as Michigan fans are concerned um, in the upcoming weeks here uh, for for both um, DJ and Mo and I think uh, yeah I'm I'm excited but I I will say I I don't think this hurts anyone either way uh, <laughs> down the lines. Uh, just because you do get that free evaluation and uh, you get to work out with some great players. But I, I will say though, I, I know you did bring up uh, Bridges as well, as far as his decision, you know, whether he's going to stay, whether he's going to go um, so on and so, so forth. I think he's probably going to go pro. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I just, uh, it, it, it'll be, um, a uh, very interesting. Oh, Adam, I, I still think you're muted um, on the on the thing, so I think you're gonna have to unmute yourself real quick. Um, okay, there you are go. we good there? Yeah, All yeah, right. we're good. Sorry, um, but yeah, I I think Bridges is gonna go pro. I feel like this is gonna be an easy decision. I don't see why you don't. And I mean, right now, I like the uh, NBA Draft Net. I like their I like their mocks and NBA Draft Express. I feel like they're fairly accurate for as and right now, uh, Miles is predicted as the 13th pick by number 13 overall by NBA Draft Net, and he's at. Sorry, here. I feel like that whole dog barking thing kind of threw threw off uh, my game a little bit. Someone <laughs> who lives down the street is like, "Hey, it's a nice day. I figured I'd just stop by." And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm recording a podcast." It's like, "Oh, I'm sorry. I was nice. I was nicer than that." <laughs> Miles, uh, NBA uh, Draft Express has him going number 11 to the Charlotte Hornets. So, I mean, pick or right there. I think I think you have to go, but there are rumblings. And 
he does love college, mm. but does he love college? I mean, if you love college, you could complete college, I guess. Is there the unfortunate circumstances of an injury? You know, that kind of, that kind of stuff. That I think in the case of Miles Bridges, as much as Michigan State fans want to, um, you know, I'm from the Flint area. I have a personal interest because I think it's great for the city regardless of where they go. And this Flint basketball tradition is really romanticized, especially around here. Not just, okay, Flint Stones at Michigan State. I mean, Kyle Kuzma, he's from Flint area. He's at Utah. He's predicted as an early second rounder. I mean, people really get behind these kids. They don't care what college they go to. You could be, there's Michigan fans that I know, and in the city of Flint, of miles and want to see him do well. Mm -hmm. It's that Flint thing, you know, it's that, it's yeah. that home, hometown kid. And with that being said, I would love to see Miles. I, f I feel I would love to see him back at Michigan State because I know that he does love college. But at the yeah. same time, I think Miles to be the best out of here. And, I mean, Mo Pete had out of the, you know, the Flintstones of late nine, mid to late 90s, Mo Pete had the best NBA career out of all of them. And he – he had a good, you know, a pretty good NBA career. He wasn't a superstar. I mean, he was an all-star, I think, a couple times, but player for the Raptors. I think Miles Bridges has the potential to really be a superstar. I really do. I believe that. And whether one more year at college gets him there, I don't know. But you're, if you're projected a lot, you got to go. And the the difference is millions of dollars. I mean, I, and then some people say, okay, well, if he returns and then next year he's a top five pick and there's millions of dollars difference in there. Okay, I, I understand that. But the here and the now is he's a projected. He's right there. If he's not in the lottery, you know, 13, 14. Yeah. I, I, get, I, get paid and want to finish your college degree, you know, go ahead and do that. But, I mean, you got to think of, your basketball career, your professional career, how many opportunities are you going to have to make this kind of money in your life? And it's the same. It's, a, it's not the same scenario as DJ MO because they're not obviously predict, you know, projected as high. Mm -hmm. when, when you're a guy like Miles, I, I feel like the money has to do most of the talking. And, and maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm underestimating his love for Michigan State and his love for his teammates in, in college. I mean, I know that it means something to him, but – dollars would also mean something <laughs> yeah i mean i i just i feel like the risk is not worth the potential reward because i mean the reward would be okay another year of the college life uh theoretically i mean if he came back michigan state is immediately the big 10 favorites they're going to be a final four favorite a preseason top five team but again i mean how many top five teams have we seen you know, suck it up and, and fail the one. I mean, look at Maryland two years ago. They were the unanimous Big Ten preseason favorites. They don't win the Big Ten. They don't even make it past the Sweet 16. Now, granted, I think Michigan State would be better than that Maryland team. But, again, I mean, that's not a guaranteed thing. And then potentially moving up in the draft. But once you're already in the lottery, I mean, unless you have a shot at number one, which if you're if you're coming back as a sophomore, I'm sorry, your odds of getting the number one pick are essentially yeah. zero. Um, some freshman's going to get it every year. But uh, so, I mean, I, I just, I don't think it's worth it when you weigh that with, you know, potential injury and, or, you know, what if he underwhelms? What if he takes a step back and you're, you're judged so much harshly, so much more harshly when you come back, when you probably should have went pro because now every play and every game is okay. Well, why isn't he dominating? You know, why isn't right. he scoring 30 points tonight? You know, he only scored 25. Your jar that margin for error is so small when you come back. And I just I don't I don't think it's worth it. I, I think if I'm him, I just head to the pros, thank Tom Izzo, thank Michigan State fans, and see what you can do at the next level. You have to. And I know that Izzo hasn't made he you know, he he doesn't like that that one and done culture. But I mean <laughs> And a lot of – when it gets in – when you start talking about recruiting and, you know, where does Tom Izzo lack? One-and-done kids don't want to play – you know, people 
conversations. Maybe Miles can at least set some kind of example. You can be a high profile guy. You can go if you want to go be a one and done. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I feel like whatever Miles does is the right decision, obviously, because it's for him. But I feel like the whole way that he's conducted himself, you almost can't look at him as just a regular one and done. And maybe that's just in my, maybe that's just my eyes because he is from Flint, the Flint area, mm-hmm. at his old school. And I think I told you the story. Um, you know, I had heard about him playing basketball and, the, and he would be eligible in a couple of years. That was the JV coach at Flint Southwestern Baseball. And I was like, man, I want to get this kid. I mean, I heard he was an awesome athlete. <laughs> Never played baseball. I'm like, man, I cannot wait to get this Miles Bridges kid. And uh, then he moves and goes 100 in prep, which was the right move for him. There was a rumor that he was going to come back and play at Flint Carmen Ains or at the senior year of high school. I'm obviously, I obviously have some Flint bias here, but I think with, with Miles and the way that Tom Izzo has talked about the whole, the whole thing, it's, it's really, I guess, bottom line, I feel like he'd be doing a favor to Tom Izzo and Michigan State by coming back. And does he feel, I don't feel like he owes them anything. I don't feel like Miles Bridges owes Michigan State anything. Miles, was, Miles wanted to go to Kentucky initially. I think Kentucky was his favorite before Michigan State really solidified it, itself. Um, I mean, he's always liked Michigan State, but I believe he said that he would, you know, he was heavily considering Kentucky. So, got him. Uh, the fact that he had an incredible season this year, and he did everything I think that was expected of. Put it this way, I feel like Michigan State fans, if Michigan State had made it to the Final Four, they wouldn't, you know, there's people, well, he maybe he does need another year that I they're, they're thinking with their heart and their fandom rather than with facts. Miles Bridges does not need another year in college basketball. No. It would be a no. bonus, mm. but athletically he's there. I mean, he's a, he's the best Flintstone as always ever had. He's the last. And I think that's what kind of makes miles a little bit more special, especially people who have covered Michigan State basketball for a long time. Maybe they're not from Flint, but they understand the Flint connection. Flint, and then there's I cover Michigan State basketball, and I'm from Flint, so I feel like I really understand that connection. So that's that. All that stuff comes into play. But Miles Bridges, my bottom line is Miles Bridges doesn't owe Michigan State anything, and uh, go get the money. Yeah, yeah, total agreement here. <laughs> I feel I feel like we've covered. We've covered a lot of bases today, and uh, I, I said that on purpose because I want to take a real, real couple minutes excited about the summer baseball season and not, the, <laughs> not talking about the Detroit Tigers. It's uh, my City League team, I, I want to say, really excited and uh, give the, have this opportunity to say that we're going to win. We're going to win the Flint CBL, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> a special at the end of the summer about uh city league baseball championships but no i'm i'm kidding i i am excited though we we recruit a lot we've got some uh you know d2 guys juco guys all you know really good in-season college players i'll be managing and and you know the idea was to recruit well enough so i wouldn't have to play and uh it's it's gonna be fun i'm the do you are you any, uh, you know, rec league? Do you do a weekend warrior, anything like that? No. Because you're going to have a whole summer of me talking about my my baseball team. I'm just I'm just warning you. That's basically what I'm saying. Um, no, no. Unfortunately, I, I don't get to do any of that. I just I don't have time. Uh, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, yeah. Me, it's mainly just uh, work, fall sports, and. Uh, Hopefully get outside here and enjoy some of this weather before it's too dark. <laughs> yeah, it's it is. It's a, it's a beautiful day. And uh want to thank everybody for listening today. You can check us out on sportsinthemitten.com. You can follow us on Twitter at uh, – we changed our handle, so it's no longer at SITM, Big and Kid. It's Mitten Sports. And that's at Mitten Sports MI on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter at Adam Biggers81. Come on, who to watch during the spring game? Thomas and I have already talked a little bit about that. So you guys have a heads up. I'll break down, you know, kind of the top tier guys, like I mentioned with uh, Rashawn Wilt and, uh, and kind of break down some position groups. 
on fanragsports.com most likely tomorrow. Uh, there will be availability uh, Tuesday and Thursday night, so I'll have some videos on my YouTube channel from that and uh, teleconference, as I mentioned earlier, Wednesday with Jim Harbaugh and other Big Ten coaches talking about spring football games. Coming up, FanRag Sports, and follow them on Twitter at FanRag underscore you. And I'm Thomas Bender. You can follow me on Twitter at tbendit. Um, and you can check out my Big Ten Hoops stuff at BT Powerhouse of SB Nation. Thanks again for watching, listening, everybody. We'll have audio uh, only if you prefer that at, on sportsinthementon.com. So have a great uh, evening, and we'll talk to you guys again later this week.